I've been vegan now for just over four years, January 2015. Um, and kind of my reasons for going vegan was always with the ethical aspects of how we use animals. And I've been vegetarian for about eight months before that. And then I saw a documentary called Earthlings, which is based in the US. It's all about US agricultural practices. And I had a little companion animal hamster at the time. His name was Rupert. And I loved Rupert so much. And after I'd watched the documentary, I went and sat next to Rupert and got him out and he was running over my hands and arms. And I started crying because I realized that the hamster that I loved in my hand was an individual. And he had his own likes and dislikes. He loved broccoli, but hated kale, like me as well, kind of ironically. <laughs> and, um, but I recognized him as being individualistic. And I thought to myself, well, hang on a second. All of these animals in that film I've watched are fundamentally individuals in the same right as Rupert the hamster in my hand. And for all the animals that I pay to be killed on my behalf, or who I pay to be commodified on my behalf are also individuals in the same way that Rupert the hamster in my hand is. And so I changed and that was to vegan at this point. But I was always really worried. I mean, we just kind of alluded, alluded to it then about being labeled as militant and extreme and fanatical and morally righteous. I really didn't want to be labeled in this way. So I kind of kept my veganism to myself. I went to university and just ate my falafel and hummus and chickpeas and all the, the normal cliche vegan food, but I didn't say anything about it. And over time, this started to, to nag on me a little bit more because I was watching more documentaries and reading more and absorbing more information. And I started to get quite angry. Like I was becoming really furious because I was like, these people are paying for animals to suffer and die and it's wrong, but no one will change or no one seems like they want to change. And I thought, well, that's not really fair of me because I'm not actually talking about this issue and I'm not raising this into people's awareness. So I can't expect people to change if they've never been asked these questions before. And so I decided I would become an activist, whatever that really meant. That was a bit of a, a, bit of a scary word to me. It's like an activist, what's this? I, I saw like protests happen in the US. That was kind of like my benchmark for what activism was like. And I thought, I don't know if I want to be like that, but I thought I need to do something. And so I started advocating by having conversations with people and going out on the street and just having dialogue and seeing what people thought. But when I started, I had this real intense anger, like I just said before, and I was really judgmental and accusatory, and I didn't listen to people very well. And so someone would say to me, well, you know, it's okay to kill an animal if you do it humanely. And I would say, what, describe humane slaughter. And they say, well, it's all right. You put electricity through the head and you cut their throat. And my reaction at that point was to say, well, how would your mum like it if that was done to her? And obviously that didn't go down very well at that point. I don't know why. I mean, it's not controversial at all. But I realized after those conversations where people became really standoffish with me, that I was doing something wrong. And I said, well, if I'm trying to help the animals and I'm trying to raise awareness about veganism, but people are becoming angry and frustrated and annoyed at me, then obviously I'm not doing this in a particularly productive or effective way. And so I had to kind of take a step back and take a little bit of humility and just say, well, what am I doing that I need to change? And I realized that it was that anger, that kind of place of resentment and frustration. It was almost kind of a, a form of misanthropy, I guess, where I was becoming really just kind of disgruntled at the state of our species and blaming everyone for the wrongs in the world, which isn't particularly fair of me to do. And so I came across this method of dialogue called the Socratic method, and it really resonated with me. And the Socratic method is, is fundamentally a form of conversation where the imperative is to ask questions rather than give answers. And I thought, well, this makes so much sense because we hate to be told what to do, right? We hate that. And we also hate to be told how we should feel. And when people tell you you're angry, even if you are angry, that makes you more angry because you don't want someone to tell you that. And so I thought, here I am pointing the finger and saying, this is wrong and you need to do this and you have to change. But that's not particularly effective. And it'd be much more effective to try and understand why people do the things that they do. And more importantly, what stops them from wanting to change in the first place? It's almost like we have a collective apathy where it's much nicer for us to fit into the status quo and not challenge what we do. And actually, that's one of the things I came across was this notion of a status quo bias, which fits into an umbrella of something called cognitive biases. And all of a sudden, it started to make much more sense to me when I researched the, the impact of, of the psychological aspects of why we are resistant to change. And it helped because I no longer felt angry because I wasn't blaming people. And so the power of the Socratic method really allowed me just to understand how people felt. And so I'd say something like, do you think animal cruelty is wrong? Everyone thinks animal cruelty is wrong. It doesn't matter if you're vegan, non-vegan, everyone agrees under that umbrella that cruelty is wrong. 
And so I'd say, well, can you define cruelty to me? What does animal cruelty look like? And the normal spiel would be that cruelty is causing or is an action or behavior that inflicts suffering that is unnecessary or pain that is unnecessary. And so then I'd say, well, okay, do we have to eat animal products to live? And people would say, no. Sometimes they'd say yes, and I'd say, which do you need? No, which nutrient? They'd say protein. I'd say, but you can get protein from beans and soy and nuts and grains and legumes and vegetables and all these other sources. And so they'd say, okay, you know, we don't need animal products to live. And I'd say, well, if it's not a necessity for survival, then by default, it's unnecessary, which by your own logic puts it into the criteria of being cruelty, which is something you're against. And all of a sudden, people resonate because they realize that this is what they feel and how they think. And they're not being told what it is they should feel or think. Instead, they're being encouraged to understand it within themselves. And so the more and more I had these conversations with people, the more and more I realized that actually we have so much in common. And we are all, of course, unique and, and very different in terms of how we see the world. But really, what kind of unites us is the fact that we're all kind of and I guess the word is victims. We're all kind of victims or products of a society in which we're raised. And so if I go back to this notion of cognitive biases that we were just, I was just discussing before, there are kind of a few big fundamental cognitive biases. Cognitive biases are, are kind of psychological imperfections, I guess, which kind of obstruct us from making decisions that are rationally in line with our logical thinking brain. And so a good example of this would be something called co confirmation bias which is where we seek out information that just realigns and reaffirms our values. And I thought, well, this makes so much sense to me because you see those anti-vegan articles, those anti-vegan videos, and they get shared like crazy and people want to see them. They want to read them and they want to share them because it reaffirms something within themselves and they want that to be true. And so we have almost, it's not a refusal, but a, a kind of a, a disappointment I don't know what the word would be. It's almost like we're disenfranchised from information that kind of contradicts our values. We want to be comfortable and we want to be safe. And that's not only physically comfortable, but also intellectually comfortable in many ways as well, especially when it comes down to something like lifestyle, which is so intrinsically unique and something we hold on to so dearly and cherish so dearly as well. And, and so confirmation bias really plays into the fact that we just want to reaffirm things that we already feel. And if the dominant paradigm is to suggest that eating or using animals is morally justifiable, well, that's what we want to be told. And then we have to couple that with a few other biases, such as the false consensus bias, which is the notion that because everyone in society does something, or the majority do, that must somehow make it acceptable. And this is something I hear a lot. People say, well, if vegans were so right, and it was the morally, I guess, righteous, or the moral imperative to be vegan, then why is it that most people aren't vegan? Well, therein lies the answer to your own question because people want to do what everybody else does. And we don't want to step out of kind of the safety of being part of the, the pack, so to speak. And if we look at kind of from an evolutionary perspective, we were community animals and we relied on each other, but fear of being ostracized was the biggest punishment of all. If we stepped out of line and did something that went against the values of our community, we'd be ostracized from that. And so intrinsically and, and primitively speaking, we want to be part of that community. And we don't want to do something that ostracizes us from the community that we exist in. And now, obviously, community to us now is very different to what it used to be to our ancestors because we're so interconnected and we're so globally joined in this day and age. But still, that fear is still deep rooted in our evolutionary past. And so to go vegan or to question something that everyone does is almost like a form of self-ostracization in the sense that we're stepping out of our comfort zone and doing something that contradicts what everyone else does. And we don't want to be judged for that. And we don't want to have our value diminished because of the lifestyle choices that we make. And then we have something called the status quo bias, which is similar, but in a sense, it means that we have a fear of change. We have a fear of doing something that alters our lifestyles, our habits, our routines, our convenience, or our cultures and traditions, as the case may well be. And so you couple these different psychological aspects together, and all of a sudden you see why it's so difficult to get someone to join the dots on, over something that we all kind of universally agree on. We're against animal cruelty and against animal suffering, yet the majority of us in some way or another pay for the suffering of animals to be perpetuated. And not only that, but we do it for our own behalf or to benefit us in some way. And that was quite liberating in a way because although it seemed like an insurmountable task to then have conversations which got through these different challenges, understanding that people aren't inherently bad was a really liberating moment 
because all of a sudden I wasn't blaming people for harming animals because I understood that there was some psychological reasoning which meant that it was really difficult for them not to harm animals. And it's not that we want to, it's just that it happens behind walls and slaughterhouses and in farms and we're fed something that isn't true. We go into Walmart, or Target or Whole Foods, wherever it is that we shop, and we see labels and packaging of happy animals. In fact, I was, I was in the supermarket yesterday and I couldn't believe what I saw. It was for an organic milk product, so cow's milk. And on the packet of the organic cow's milk was a picture of a mother holding her baby leaning into the, the dairy cow. And so as an average consumer, you see that and that paints just a wholesome picture of the dairy industry. But what they don't tell you in the dairy industry is that baby calves are taken away from their mothers because if the calves drink from the mother, that's less milk for the farmer to sell. And so all of a sudden that simple imaging, which seems so idyllic and peaceful, becomes insidious and sinister, almost like a taunting because there's a mother and her baby leaning into a mother who's had her baby taken away from her. But that's not what we're told. And so in essence, the commodification of animals becomes larger than that. It's almost like the commodification of us as well, the commodification of humans, both when we look at what happens to humans in slaughterhouses and indeed on farms, but even the manipulation that we go through as consumers, where we're sold something that isn't true. In essence, we're commodified for our compassion, because if we knew the truth, we'd want to buy the soy milk or the oat milk or the almond milk, but instead we buy the cow's milk because our biases say that we should, and we're fed a label that feeds into our compassion and the fact that we are against animal cruelty. And so there's this whole web of marketing and of psychological barriers that make this kind of just a, a loop where we just continue perpetuating something that deep down many of us are probably actually against. But having these conversations, it provoked one question in me, which was how do we define our morality when we commodify animals? How do we define what it means to be good to animals? What is the moral code that we employ when we view animals? Because just something doesn't seem to line up. We live in a paradoxical situation almost. And so part of the inspiration for that was for me to then start learning all the different arguments and all the different excuses that we use and to see if they fit into some sort of consistent notion of morality. And so when we look at issues of commodification in relation to ethics and morality, we have to assign a couple of criteria to our moral code. And the things we have to assign is we have to say, are we being logically honest or are we being logically dishonest? Are the excuses that we're using based in truth or are they based in conjecture and speculation? But more importantly, are they without contradiction and are they non-arbitrary? And so we can apply this way of thinking to kind of a, a human context. And we can say that something like, um, in something like white supremacy would be in effect immoral, obviously for a number of reasons, but we can boil it down to a couple of notions. And that is obviously to, to be um, authoritative over someone because of a, a notion like the skin color is an arbitrary reason. It's based in no kind of differentiation between the two individuals. But also it's a complete contradiction in itself because we say, well, the white supremacists would say that they value their life based on the fact that they're conscious and they're sentient and they're individuals and they can suffer. But then it's, non well, it's, it's a contradiction in terms to not apply that same kind of way of thinking to every human because every human is of course sentient, conscious, individualistic and has an experience of life that is unique to them. And importantly, they can all suffer, experience happiness, feel pain and have a preference to avoid the negative emotions and to feel the positive emotions. And so I thought, well, okay, that seems fair enough. But one of the things that people often say to me is that I don't subscribe to the morality that you subscribe to. And often people say, yes, but morality is subjective, meaning that morality doesn't even exist. And I thought, well, that seems like quite a tangent to go by. And one day this person said to me that he defined himself as an existential nihilist. And I thought, wow, that seems like quite a big heavy term. And so I thought, okay, an existential, existential nihilist. And I said, well, describe what that means to you. And he says, well, I believe that life intrinsically has no purpose and there's no definition of morality, meaning there's no such thing as right and wrong. And I said then, but do you think that you are better than, than an animal? And he said, yeah, I think humans are better than animals. And I said, well, by default, you've contradicted yourself then because the idea of existential nihilism would, would suggest and ascertain that all life is equal because all life is completely devoid of purpose or any meaning. So then to place value on your own species means that you've created the system of morality within your own self. You just have refusal to accept it because 
it's easy to say you're an existential nihilist if it means you can continue harming others. And so there's a contradiction in almost every form of morality when we apply it to how we view animals. And so let's link what we were saying to the commodification of animals. Because if we say that it's wrong to commodify a human because they're conscious, sentient, and have an individualistic experience of life, then by default, to be consistent, we have to say that it's morally wrong to commodify a non-human animal because they too, especially the ones that we exploit conventionally, like pigs and cows and chickens and sheep and even salmon and tuna, they too are sentient, conscious, and have experience of life that is individualistic and unique to them. So to be morally consistent, if it's wrong to commodify humans, it must be wrong to commodify non-human animals as well. And that seemed fairly straightforward, but people didn't seem to buy that. They'd normally go for a whole list of other excuses. And so there's a whole ton of excuses that we can probably think of that suggest that we shouldn't be vegan. And I kind of simplified these and boiled these down to a few subcategories. And so I'd refer to the, the biggest category as being the hedonistic excuses. So that's sensory pleasure. So that looks at taste. It looks at you know, enjoyment from watching bullfighting or going to the rodeo. It looks at vanity, you know, if you enjoy how you, how you feel when you wear fur. Sensory pleasure, something that brings us intrinsic value and egoistic value, so to speak. Another would be convenience. So we say, well, it's inconvenient for me to go vegan because I have to change how I shop or buy some other products or change my recipe or eat a vegan cheese that I don't like as much. Some vegan cheese is terrible, by the way. Like. But some of it's really good. And so actually the convenient argument becomes a little bit of a contradiction itself because it's just about changing habits and routines. And when you get over that hurdle, it becomes fairly simple. Um, and then we can break it down into another category. And these would be defined more as the um, predetermined, I would say. And so if we look at issues of carnism and, and Melanie Joy, it, has that been taught? Yeah. 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 Well, we had an option, I think, but okay. it's... So I mean, so those of you who have read it, might know, but for those of you who don't, it, it, carnism explores the relationship of kind of an invisible belief system that permeates through society, which is why we love dogs, eat cows and eat pigs. But, you know, we have different viewpoints depending on the species of animal. And so uh, kind of moralistically, that would be defined as kind of a cultural or traditional or like a societal norm, which is why I group these as being the predetermined excuses, because these are things that are kind of out of our hands, something we don't have control over, how we're raised, the values that are assigned to us, what our parents teach us, what culture and society teaches us. And obviously, you know, that, that kind of couples in with that contradiction of we look at Yulin in, you know, in China and Southeast Asia where they consume dogs and we say, morally, that's abhorrent, you know, that's wrong. We look at maybe Spain where there's bullfighting and we say, morally, that's wrong. We look at Japan where they slaughter dolphins and we say, morally, that's wrong. Or in uh, the Faroe Islands off the coast of Denmark where they slaughter pilot whales and we say, morally, that's wrong. But actually on our own doorstep is the exact same level of brutality, the same level of violence, almost amplified and exemplified by the fact that we do it in such a huge system where the killing is so systematic and on such a scale that we can't even really comprehend that, what, what that looks like. And yet we point the finger and we assign that what others do is immoral, but what our culture does is somehow morally justified because it's the culture that we were raised in, the predetermined. And the other, the other subcategories are an appeal to nature. And so I find this becomes a really prevalent category because people say, well, we're omnivores and we have canine teeth and it's part of the food chain, it's the circle of life. Our ancestors used to consume animals. If your ancestors didn't eat meat, you wouldn't be alive today. An appeal to nature, which in essence seems to be grounded in some notion of, of logic and rational thought, but it kind of overlooks the fact that we live in a very modern contemporary society. And importantly, it overlooks the fact that we do have something called moral agency, which isn't necessarily unique to humans, but is something that we embody uh, in a very kind of powerful way. And so moral agency basically means that we are able to make no or we're able to make decisions based on a notion of right and wrong. And importantly, we can also be held accountable for the decisions that we make. And so when we, we make an appeal to nature fallacy and we look at what others are doing in the wild or what our ancestors used to do, and we try to assign those morals and those values to a modern day society, we're in essence doing ourselves a disservice and taking away the fact that we live in a very contemporary world where we're able to make decisions based on what we perceive to be right and wrong. And not only what we perceive to be right and wrong, but what we objectively know to be right and wrong as well. And I think part of the problem with morality is it gets confused with, with kind of an old time feeling of Judeo-Christian values. And we think, well, you know, morality is, is, is kind of an ever shifting, ever changing paradigm, which of course it is. But what it's grounded in is kind of a consistent notion of suffering. 
we look at what's right and wrong based on the impact that it has on others. I mean, that's how we've defined our society so far and importantly, how we've progressed as a society so far by looking at whether or not our actions include a victim. And so when we commodify animals as well, the decision that we have to make is whether or not we class them as being a victim. And part of the problem of that is how we refer to animals in the first place, because the commodification of animals is obviously both physical, but it's also through language and through terminology as well. And so when we refer to an animal as an it, what we do is we demote them from a being to an object. We commodify them through the language that we use. We assign them the value of property based on just the fact that we call them an it, when in fact animals are not inanimate objects, they're beings. And so we should call them a someone or a they or a them, a being that possesses a life that means behind their eyes they have a conscious awareness of the world around them. And so commodification happens in, in many forms. It's not just going to a supermarket and buying them, it's how we generally view animals in the world and what place they have amongst us in this planet. And so part of being vegan for me isn't just about buying soy milk or buying the Beyond Meat burger. It's about how we view that symbiotic nature that we have with other animals that coexist in this world with us. And I strongly believe that actually it's through kind of a, a devolution of that commodification that we can progress as a society and how we view each other as well. Because while we cling on to notions of supremacy and notions of kind of superiority, it's such a holdback and such a, a pullback from us actually further progressing. And so one of the words that's often used in connotation with animal commodification is the word speciesism, which is to do with human supremacy. And so that would be another subcategory, human supremacy. And that would look at intelligence. That could be used for religion as well, a doctrine that says that animals are beneath humans and that humans were made in God's image and therefore worthy of life. And so supremacy could be another one. And then another subcategory would be looking at notions of practicality. And I think this is where the thinking mind really plays a part because we can kind of rationalize a lot of the other arguments through veganism. And we can look at how these other arguments don't create a system that morally justifies the use of animals. But, but the issue of practical thinking creates more of a, a rational thought process. And so we might say, well, how will veganism impact the world that we live on? And we can look at the environmental impacts. Can we produce enough food to feed everyone if we're all vegan? Like land usage, do we have enough land to produce all the plants we need for everyone to eat vegan? And so we look at issues of the environment because the environmental aspects of it is tied so closely in with, with veganism as well. We have to kind of understand that part of being vegan, as like I said before, is a symbiotic notion of living harmoniously. And that doesn't mean just living cooperatively with animals, it means living cooperatively with our environment as well. And looking at notions of climate change and how consuming animals impacts our environment. You can look at greenhouse gas emissions, you know, land desertification, topsoil erosion, um, water usage as well. But more intrinsically, the question we have to ask ourselves is, is there a necessity for us to eat animals? Not just from a nutrient perspective, but in terms of a calorie perspective as well. And can we feed every mouth on this planet with a plant-based diet? And so actually a lot of the science suggests that we can resoundingly do so, and not only resoundingly do so, but in fact, it's the only way that we will be able to feed every mouth on this planet is through adopting that plant-based diet. Because as we know, the consumption of animals is incredibly detrimental on an environmental level, but it's unsustainable because it requires such a, a huge amount of crop usage just to meet the amount of food that people desire to eat. And so herein lies the problem, that notion of desire. And so for all of these excuses that we go through, rather, you know, the rational thought process of commodification, it kind of ends up with that notion of desire that notion of taste, which is what we touched upon kind of near the beginning. That notion of, I want to do this. I enjoy doing this. This is something that I find pleasure in. And from the conversations I have with people, this is what always seems to happen. We go on a roundabout journey where we look at different issues and different excuses, but it always comes down to that one holy grail. I like how meat tastes. I like how cheese tastes. I like how eggs taste. And so this is what morality boils down to in that sense of, well, how do we justify that action? Do we require more than sensory pleasure to justify that? Because a world where sensory pleasure dictates what's right and what's wrong becomes a pretty scary world. We think of all the things that people in this world can enjoy that cause harm to others. We don't justify those simply because they cause enjoyment. And if you apply it to a, a non-human animal context, we look at bullfighting, like I mentioned before, people find great thrills in bullfighting. It doesn't provide a justification for bullfighting to continue. And so when we look at taste as being the, the beacon of why people do what they do, the question becomes what has higher value, taste or life? The life of an animal or our taste buds. If we have a weighing scale, 
which one's heaviest on that scale. Because really that's what it boils down to. In the absence of necessity and the absence of any practical reasoning, then it becomes a selfish desire, which doesn't mean we're intrinsically bad because like I said before, there's so many reasons why we fitted into this mold of doing what we do. But if that's the baseline for why we do what we do, sensory pleasure and enjoyment, then we have to ask ourselves, well, what world are we entering into? Or more importantly, what world do we want to enter into? And is the commodification of animals something that needs to be considered? Is it a moral imperative for us to look beyond the things that we've always done and the paradigms that we've been born into and instead assess and analytically contemplate whether or not this is something that needs to be changed? I'd be interested to know. I mean, I'm going to come around and have little pockets of conversation during the second part of it. But I do want to leave you with these, these ideas and these questions of, well, which has high value? What justification would you use? Does the commodification of animals need a different form of justification to the commodification of humans? Or do the two both come syn kind of symbiotically together based on the fact that we are all alive, conscious, and sentient? And through those basic foundations of what it means to be alive, should we all be considered in the same circle of moral compassion? And importantly, what do we define our moral code as being? How do we define our view of the world? What do we think of other cultures and the actions that they commit? Do we think that they're acceptable or not acceptable? And if we think they're not acceptable, then what does that tell us about what we do to animals and how we view animals? And importantly, if our environment's at risk, then why wouldn't we change? Why wouldn't we take a long, hard look at ourselves and say, with so much on the line and so much at stake, both our planet, the animals, and potentially our own health as well, what stops us from making that change? And what stops us from looking with a critical eye at the things that we do? And so taste our life, the life of an animal, the life of our planet, our own life as well. What has higher value? And if we say taste, how do we justify that? Do we justify that? In what way? Because as we've said before, there's so many excuses, so many reasons, so many elements to consider. But if we find no justification for taste, then life must always have higher value. In the case that life has higher value, that tells us what we need to know, know about commodification, it tells us what we need to know about how we view others. And I guess that's the question I'd leave you with. On that scale of life and taste, where do you fit, both as an individual, but also collectively as a species, where should we align ourselves? And um, I don't want to talk too much more because...